This episode of the Lost and Found podcast is actually taken from me appearing as a guest on Nick Knack's Coffee Table. Nick has become a friend of mine over the last few months as he's been joining the weekly free call that I host and he's recently started a podcast and it really was my honor to join him and to share some of my story with him and he's kindly agreed to allow me to share that as an episode. Very often, as I have guests on here, I'm kind of asking questions about them and wanting to have those conversations and find out more about them. And this seemed like a nice opportunity to share a little bit more background about me through appearing as a guest on his. Nick really is a wonderful soul. You can really feel it from him energetically. And he has an amazing story himself. And to find out more about Nick, I'm going to add the links in the description to find him, his podcast, his website. And I'm sure at some point I'll have Nick on the podcast to find out more about him and to share his story. Now, before we dive into it, two things. One, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please hit that subscribe button because it really helps. And secondly, if you would like to join the free call that I host weekly that Nick is also on and a part of, then the link is going to be below to be able to join that. And it's ultimately a community of like-minded people just showing up in a very honest and authentic way that share part of their journey of self-exploration. So if that calls you, find that in the link below. All right, that's it from me. I hope you enjoy this episode taken from Nick Knack's Coffee Table. Oh, uh, hey, Sabri. So, uh, yeah, nice to have you today on the podcast. Huh? Uh, like, uh, who is Sabri and what are you up to these days? What are you doing? <laughs> mm, hey, brother. Well, first of all, thank you for, for having me. It's it's great to be here and to be, you know, sharing the space and, and sharing myself and, and receiving you. Who is Sabri? Well, now that is a question. Um, <laughs> um, a big question as well. You know, a big question that I think a lot of us can sit with where we ask, you know, who who am I? Who am I? Um, and I would say it's, it's something that's actually become more and more clear for me over the last... Hmm year in the last year after really having been on quite a deep journey of self-discovery self-exploration and personal growth for about 21 years i feel like the last year 20 years later I'm, I'm starting to get close but something tells me that in the pursuit of that i'm aware there's like a there's a non-fixedness to it so now I realize that actually I'm an evolutionary self, which means there's going to be this constant evolution, you know, just throughout the lifetime. And it's actually kind of holding the paradox there of the more I get to know myself, the more I get to know that I'm ever changing and ever evolving. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Huh? And it is. Huh? It's, uh, yeah. How to say this is like this process of life. It's, learning uh an endlessly almost there is no limit so like uh, yeah self-discovery like yeah where is the bottom where is the top there is no i would say so it's just continuously um yeah and that's something that i realized for myself as well and it's really beautiful actually so as soon as you start to embrace this then there is no limit to it and you can just keep on going <laughs> and no matter how far you want to go like it uh, it's all open uh, ready to be embraced no? <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah so so much so you know i just think taking away the parameters of who we think we are because that really is it isn't it is who we think we are mm -hmm. the story no yeah and and outside of that you know i i try to connect more and more now with the idea of what i am rather than who i am mm -hmm. because this who I believe is just it is evolutionary is it's evolving throughout the lifetime but the what when I anchor into the what I am I kind of have the felt knowing and realization of the potential there's a greater potential for who I can be when I'm more connected to to what I am mm -hmm. you know to a, a unique expression of of the divine of of the one consciousness and 
you know, just being aware of the the vastness of what that looks like, how how grand that that palette is, and you know, so often we can think with this fragmented portion of that, but I really believe in the in the what we are. It's so vast, and then within that what, we will go through times and phases of different who's. Right now, who am I? Okay, well, I, I feel like I'm this kind of person that ticks these boxes, but I can definitely say I've lived multiple lifetimes in this life. <laughs> Never yeah. mind the ones before. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but just, just in this one, I've had wildly different uh, phases of life where I've looked completely different, where the things I've done have been completely different. And because I've always been a person that goes all in on things that I do. Um, that's kind of probably been one of my character traits from a young age. You know, when I get into something, I really get into it. So there's like this, there's this capacity to reinvent myself, almost like Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so throughout my teens, it was, I was fully immersed in martial arts, you know, training 13 times a week and, by the time I was 16, I was teaching 23 classes a week. And then I got into bodybuilding in my late teens and then competed in my early 20s. And, you know, then I was, I carried a lot more muscle and I had a shaved head and I looked completely different and dressed completely different. And then I went through these other phases. And, and I think it's just like, I think there's something actually quite nice about the idea of just believing that what I want to turn my attention to, that I can just lean fully into that. And I almost don't feel um, bound by about by the idea of, of who I think I need to be. And I'm okay with having these kind of extreme changes. And, you know, I can say now looking back at life so far, I'm 35 now, that it's been quite beautiful to have these breadth, of experiences but within the breadth and the range of the experiences there's also been depth that's gone along with it because i go so deep into things so yeah yeah that's uh really that is the beauty about it as well to go all the way into like almost half work is not uh fully set but satisfying i don't know if this is the right word um but I understand it. It's something that I, I, I've been holding for myself up as well. And if you really want to get to know stuff or want to dive into something, then you go all the way. And yeah, the depth that it brings along with it. I share it in the same way, like you just did it. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. I'm looking for my words here. <laughs> uh, yeah, and yeah, I express it as well. Uh, often to people that are really... I've lived already almost like so many different lifetimes in just in this one singular life experience for the moment, uh, because it's almost uncomprehensible or difficult to put into words to even express it to someone else, if you want to share it in a way as well. But it's beautiful, uh, like how did spirituality uh, actually became a part of your life? What I heard from other podcasts and places that you already shared your story, is that you were very well here in the physical world and in society with the expectations that we all experience and how things are going on. Mm. And how did this came into your life? Uh, awareness about more that is going around. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because as as time goes on, I can then, I get two reference points of this, what I'm going through now, and then I can look back to as I went through these moments that seemed like they were happening there and then, but with an expanded level of awareness, I can actually then start to look back to when I was very young and experiences I had then, which at the time I didn't know how to compute. So on one hand, I could say my more spiritual journey began maybe seven years ago, but if 
I was really to zoom out, I, I deeply believe in the continuity of consciousness. And I don't think this is my first life where I've been kind of committed to this, this, this space and this, this idea. Um, but let's say when I was, when I was 13, I read the, the Tao of Jeet Kune Do by, by Bruce Lee, which mainly was a philosophical book. And then uh, I started listening to Wayne Dyer when I was 14, um, who's a, a kind of like a, one of the original kind of crossovers of kind of spiritual to self-development kind of teachings. And throughout my teens, I'd listen to people like Wayne Dyer and Zig Ziglar and Brian Tracy and Deepak Chopra and Stephen Covey and Tony Robbins, um, and, you know, Think and Grow Rich and, and those types of things. This kind of like, you know, the, the emergence of like self-development, I suppose. And a lot of it was rooted in kind of personal growth to be a higher achiever ultimately was kind of the the place that it was coming from it wasn't so much about having a spiritual connection it was to um i guess wayne dyer for me was one that i found calming because i had a real temper i was very explosive when i was younger um which i guess was maybe somewhat learnt. um and then the other stuff was to try to tr was to try to, to to better myself you know um the idea of bettering myself and i did that and i was on that path and i wanted to achieve and progress and do more and be more and have more and do all that kind of stuff that's largely associated you know with oh i mean i would say the west but i think now it's probably just global really um so i did that um I was, you know, kind of, kind of did well with it, you know, in, in my mid twenties, I was kind of like, I kind of became what I thought I was meant to be and what would place me as in society as being valuable. Mm -hmm. So there was my perception of that at the time. So at the time I was, you know, muscular and lean, I was in good shape and I had the supercar and I was dating attractive women and I was doing the the stuff that i thought okay like as a as a guy in my mid-20s um I'm, I'm doing it yeah um and actually i can look back at that time and and without like kind of judgment of it of it being wrong I, I don't think it was it actually felt like the exact thing i should have done at that time because i believe that to be the path so i walk the path that i believe to be the believe to be the right one and i kind of look back at myself with a sense of actual kind of almost admiration of like, well done, man. Like you were really focused in your early twenties. You know, I stopped drinking when I was 21. I was really focused on training hard and bodybuilding. And I stopped my business when I was 21. And I look back at that and I think, well done, well done. Um, the effort was there, you know, the effort was there. Yeah. Uh, uh. Um, yeah. Would you say that there was a certain sense of fulfillment? Or did you have something like, okay, but I, now I already achieved this and, and what now? Uh, hmm. Yeah, so I'm not sure how much fulfillment goes along with all those things. And I think that's largely part of the the, the disillusion of that narrative is that we believe it will lead to that. Yeah. So there was never really a sense of fulfillment maybe there was a sense of relief of feeling less of the pain of the person that I was, that I was trying to escape. So I'd say it was more relief of not being that person than it was as being fulfilled and feeling whole. It was more from an, it was more of an away from kind of driver where I was trying not to be the person that I once was. So it was really kind of largely built on that premise and it wasn't until I was 27 when I met my daughter's mother where some things were triggered in me and it brought back memories that I'd that genuinely felt like a past life, but it was from when I was like, you know, early to mid teen years and just how like self-loathing i was and how much i didn't want to be me and remembering all the kind of turmoil that i felt and just 
just for existing really and i'd actually forgotten i'd for, i'd i'd moved so far away and this was the person i was trying to escape i'd moved so far away from that i'd actually completely it was, it was like it was erased from my memory that i was ever like that because yeah. i became the absolute opposite of that <laughs> and it, I, I remember it clearly i remember laying in bed and she was asleep and i was looking at the ceiling and all of a sudden this wave of memories but not just memories all the associated feelings just came straight over me and i was laying on the bed looking at the ceiling like what the fuck is going on <laughs> yeah. and then that really began this almost like kind of dark night of the soul for me um and this was late uh, so, so I, I was i was 27 i was halfway through i guess my 28th year and the way i describe it it was almost like there was a very tall building that i'd built but with no foundation so i hadn't gone deep in to lay the foundations to build the structure on top i just created a structure and again i only did what i kind of thought was 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 the right thing i didn't really have a reference point or like mentorship or you know the, a thing to say hey brother maybe we need to go a little deeper before we go up <laughs> um so in one way it was inevitable but i think sometimes what we can do is we can look back at these things and like oh i was doing the complete wrong thing and actually for the things that we have presented to us and with our level of awareness at that moment in time it was probably the right thing that i did because that's that's all i had as 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 a model of this is the path so i did that thing now i can look back in hindsight and realize oh i was off here here's where i was off but ultimately i was off because and very much in the west we don't really have that type of guidance of a, a, a path to more levels of you know expanded consciousness and, and i say we don't have the guidance not kind of just structurally we can seek it out and it is available but we have to find it really. Yeah. And at that time, that's the path I was on. So that led to like, I would say really seven years, seven years of, you know, deep inner work. And sometimes now, you know, in the, I'm going to hop timelines a little bit, but now when I, when I coach, you know, and sometimes people think like a few weeks, a few weeks and, uh, you know, I would have done the work and it's like, well, oh, maybe, but like I, I was seven years like deep in and and I think, you know, again, just from the place of not that I constantly need to heal, because I don't think that is the case, but the part of the evolution of constantly evolving, you know, there's gonna be different things that come up where maybe that thing wasn't relevant a year ago. And now something kind of in this new emergence of me now, maybe something comes up and it's like, oh, okay. Maybe that needs addressing. Mm -hmm. um, just giving some attention to that. And um, yeah, so seven years, that's kind of when I first did ayahuasca was about seven years ago. And I'd say that was the first time where I really had a reference for what God was. And there was this deeper sense of, you know, it was about, I don't know, an hour into my first journey of feeling, oh, I had no idea what God was before. <sighs> And it's like my eyes had been opened for the first time. And I think this actually, for, for me personally, you know, the stories about Jesus and making the blind man see, something tells me the reference was to opening people's eyes to God rather than actually someone who is physically blind and then being able to see. Something yeah. tells me it was more relation to allowing people to actually see what God was and feeling that person was blind before. Yeah, no, there's a lot of symbology in those stories as well. Uh, I can definitely relate to it as well. Uh, at a specific point, uh, the culture, the, both of it, uh, I think the UK and Belgium, it's not so far from difference in culture, I would say. Yeah? That we're just raised in this materialistic world and like it's, it's all about the physical and the things around us, but that we really lost the inside of what the connection from within is mm. uh, in a way and then yeah having these kind of discoveries of opening up to our own divinity uh, as what we are as beings or what we are to do here uh, that it's 
definitely valuable if you start to look to these concepts and ideas and stories through a different lens now uh, when you wake up like uh, becoming a person that is not blind anymore but seeing uh, that it is all of a sudden it gets a whole different context a whole different layer i don't know how, how to express it actually um but it is beautiful how you say this that you gain deeper insights after the ayahuasca ceremonies and that it even connects you to concepts that are also described for example in the bible and in many different religions as well but it gets a completely different image than the thing that we get from a, a religious per perspective um so yeah and it's unique if that it comes to plant uh which was for me a big eye opener as well because i uh, if you now go back to the amazon and then the days that, that uh, you know had like the catholic church diving into the amazon and trying to uh, enforce religion on the indigenous people while they actually already had a very deep connection and insight in the divinity of what is you know and then yeah seeing now back that these plants are actually bringing this deeper insight again from yeah what the divine is to us and how we are connected to it and it, it's really amazing and actually mind-blowing yeah? and it, it was almost like yeah uh, it was devilish you know like oh no don't work with plants and no it's crazy it's the work of the devil you know <laughs> But then it's beautiful to see how this all reconnects again uh, and how this all yeah brings it all together again yeah you know i think um a lot of catholicism was really a political movement mm -hmm. uh, it was empire and empire loves to corrupt and it loves to seek power and you know, it, it would obviously be a threat to have these plants, you know, these plants that are linked to the devil. Well, funny that, like plants, nature. Yeah. <laughs> mm. um, created by God. Mm. Mm. That we take and then feel this deep connection to God. Now, why why might it be that an establishment or an institution and this is not a conspiracy, it's just a question. Why might an establishment or an institution that says you have to come to our place to access God and you have to enter into our hierarchy to access God, why might they not be keen on the idea that here's a plant you can take anywhere and access God? Just mm -hmm. a question. Just a question. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It's almost like, uh, why wouldn't I be allowed to directly connect to God? Uh, if this is open for everybody, why do you need to go through a third party to achieve connection in a way? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, wouldn't you know, it, it comes straight away from Catholicism as well. Uh, it's something that's very, very deeply rooted in in the world that we know today as well. Um, and yeah, the thing is also. I, I learned for myself that it actually is also a very important part of the learning process that we're going through. And in a way, that it was also a necessary experience in, in human existence to go through this part. Because um, yeah, we, we have to learn to embrace the full spectrum, which includes as well the shadow, uh, the darkness, and yeah, whatever corruption that is going on. Or how would you interpret that uh, in your own experience? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I am such a believer that we have to be able and willing to see our own darkness. We actually have to. And I was having this conversation just two days ago with someone uh, that I met at the mystery school in Belgium last week that I was at with um, one of my uh, mentors, you know, Dr. Mark Gaffney. And... Um, and I, I was talking to um, Colette, someone that I met there, and we connected really, really deeply, like a really uh, deep and incredible soul. And I, I felt it immediately within kind of minutes of meeting her that, oh, there's a depth and complexity here that most people aren't aware of. It was just, I could just feel it. And you know, we had these conversations and we were talking the other day about, um, you know, like 
one's darkness and i was as you were saying that i seem to have the ability to see the good and, and the light in people and i believe the reason i can do that even even if they seem to be behaving in a way that appears to be what we could say in their shadow you know dark but i think the only reason i do that is because i'm intimately aware of my own darkness my own capacity and ability for darkness and I think someone who isn't aware of that in themselves is a dangerous person because you don't know how to spot it in yourself. So you don't know how to manage it, how to navigate it. It's only because I'm intimately aware of my own capacity for, for, for darkness that I can actually choose the light. Yeah. It's because I, I actually, I actually see it so I can choose it. So therefore I can see other people in their shadow and I can see, Oh no, this is their shadow. There's something else beyond this because I've had to live that myself and go through my own shadow. So I'm intimately aware of it. But now, as much as I possibly can, I I stay aware of it and, and choose to be in a more loving and empathetic and compassionate state. Now, does that mean I'm there all the time? No. But part of my evolutionary process is trying to exist more and more in that place as much as possible. So that's the individual perspective. Now, from the collective perspective, I think collectively, we've had to see the absolute capacity for darkness of humanity, not as an individual, but as a species. I mean, if you think over the last couple of thousand years, we have really seen our capacity for darkness. And again, if any one of us thinks it is not in us, we're ultimately fooling ourselves because we're of the one consciousness. We're all humanity, and it is part of our humanity. So we have to look at ourselves. We have to look at the whole picture of humanity. And something tells me is that we've, in the evolutionary process of our species, which we're about 300,000 years in, and that's really a young species compared to dinosaurs that roamed the earth for hundreds of millions of years. We're actually still pretty young. So I think we've actually had to see our darkness so then collectively, we can become aware of our darkness and begin to choose the light. And I actually think that's what we're starting to see emerge right now. Yeah. I think we're seeing, we've witnessed our insanity, our darkness collectively as a species. And now we're seeing things like the plant medicine renaissance, uh, renaissance you know, the psychedelics. We're seeing this, this seems to be an awakening, more and more people becoming aware and conscious and starting to, kind of return back to this idea of spiritual practice, which we've abandoned for a long time. But I think it's a response to be able to witness our, our, our potential for insanity and darkness. And now through seeing that, we can begin to choose differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now you can see that the change comes from within it. No? And that like each individual can only take uh, the responsibility of the choices and the change within to bring it outside and to bring it as a part into the collective. No? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we we really do have to be the thing that we want to see all around us. Yeah, yeah. Like Gandhi says, uh, be the change you want to see. Yeah. yeah something that I take to take in my heart for for a long time uh, in the beginning of my path I try to navigate uh, that way so much so I mean it's been on my mind an incredible amount since I returned from Belgium because the thing that Mark Gaffney is doing and people in the, the think tank for the center of world philosophy and religion is creating a new story for humanity and the idea is is that and, and it's the idea that I believe in, I'm, I'm fully with. The current story doesn't work. The current story, the, the current story for humanity is broken. And we need a new story of value, a new grammar of value, new context for value. And as we're going through this last week, through the different aspects and this idea of like, we need to become the new human, new humanity. We need to go from Homo sapien to Homo amor. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, I think before. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, Aubrey Marcus podcast as well that he mentioned this concept. Yeah, and so so Mark is Mark 
Gaffney has been doing one-to-ones teachings with Aubrey for about a year and a half now. So Aubrey will frequently uh, quote Mark. And actually, the think tank, um, Aubrey is becoming the chair of the board. So mm-hmm. Aubrey's stepping into the think tank. Um, and I was with the the board in Vermont in June. Yeah. And I've been st- invited to be on the board and I've been stepping in uh, in, in that space there. And, and it's beautiful to be seen in that way. And yes, to to just return to that point with the new story for humanity, you know, the, the old one's broken. We need the new story. What I've come away with is I just keep asking myself, how would the new human do this? How would the new human respond to that? It, but on small things throughout my day, if I get a message for someone where I feel like before I might have responded slightly more defensively, I ask my question, I ask the question, how would the new human respond to this? homo or more, you know, a person of love, how would that, and I'm trying to inform my days, my daily, just the small daily tasks, how would the new human do this? Because if we truly want to create a new humanity, a new story of value for humanity, we have to be it. We can't just talk about it because that doesn't inspire anyone. It's only when they feel it in the depth of your being. And if this feels like a more beautiful way of living, that people go, I, I not I want some of this. I need this. I need this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah, it's like you said, and it's not only about talking about it and thinking about it, but then we really have to start to apply the actions towards cultivating this as well uh, in ourselves, and ultimately, ultimately to share it as well. And it's really like a daily practice, uh, and that it's not something that like oh yeah no. I achieved it and it's gone. I, I'm done with my work. I uh, know it's really that is uh, like you are continuously building on top of it uh, and building and building and letting it grow, like cultivating your garden with plants. Uh, uh, like it takes constant care uh, and love to yeah, have a beautiful garden and to maintain the garden as well. It, it does, absolutely. And if, and if you leave a garden unmaintained, mm-hmm. what spreads through the gra- garden and grows? Me too. <laughs> Yeah, the weeds, you know, if you if you leave it un, untended, that they do spread through. But to have a beautiful garden, yeah, it takes takes um a level of effort and a level of care and a level of attention. And I think, you know, if we apply that to ourselves, it, it works in the same way. And it's actually it creates so many beautiful moments in life where even coming away from from Belgium that within the 24 hours that I came away, there was three little things that happened that I just thought, hmm, I don't think these things would have happened before. Now I'm really being mindful of, because I'm serious about this. I'm serious with stepping into the board and I feel like I need to embody the thing that we're talking about. I need to embody it. I have to be it. Otherwise it's just words. It's just theory. It's just, it's just dogma. Actually, yeah what what was christ what was jesus he was the embodiment of the thing he was talking about Mm -hmm. that's why it was so powerful so if we want to have a sense of power and the ability for this thing to really kind of move we've got to be it and i got on the flight back from belgium to england and um there was there there was a guy in the the flight that i i don't know i would i would guess he was on, on the spectrum for autism and just how his behavior was it it seemed reminiscent with that and he was like you could see there was like a high level of anxiety and you know he he had a pillowcase as his carry-on bag and has had things in a pillowcase and then he couldn't find his boarding pass and he just emptied everything out on the floor really frantically like i don't know where it is and you could see like it was a very like frenetic kind of energy and then he was just one person behind me and we were waiting and people were putting their bags in the overhead storage. And he just shouted out like, what the hell's taking so long? And I just turned and just looked at him just really gently, just looked at him right in the eyes. And I just said, oh, people are just putting their bags in the space. So people have to wait for that. And then they sit down and oh, okay. And I just looked at him, I held the eye contact and I said, are you okay? 
He said, yeah, yeah, I just, I, I didn't, I didn't sleep. I didn't sleep much. I said, yeah, I feel you. I said, this last week I've been away. I've been having like three hours sleep each night and two last night. I know how it is, right? We can get tired. And then his energy dropped. But what I noticed was people around seemed a bit nervous of his energy. I noticed everyone else's energy when they kind of just, it felt like to see me hold a softness around him and was like, I didn't need to be in resistance that I could meet it with love. I noticed the energy around me of everyone just kind of like, uh, almost like everybody sensed that somebody was holding uh holding the 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 rock into the space like it. yeah so so that was that was one example where i thought hmm i feel like that's how the new human would interact in those scenarios and it's not that easy eh? definitely also if you know from your own experiences uh, that you have been coping with temper as well and trying to deal with it in your own life uh you really need a certain capacity and, and skill set and knowing yourself to be able to do this, uh, to hold that energy now. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the things I has probably served me well in that area specifically is I don't feel, I rarely feel the, like physical threat just because, you know, I've been martial arts for such a long time and I'm still like, I'm 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 still not a small guy, you know. I'm ninety something kilo or you know a couple of hundred pounds, and it's not like I'm a small person. Um, so I I never really feel like I need to be nervous because I'm at risk physically here, because I know if it came to it, I could just kind of you know control the situation if it if it escalated in 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 that manner. And um, my camera keeps just tracking for me. <laughs> <laughs> and um so so yeah and and also I, I worked as a bouncer in my early 20s and i was actually really good at de-escalating through through talking um even when i was 21 22 um so that that was one example then i get home and i need to go and get some food in so i go to the store to get some some bits and then there was there was a woman there that she looked at me and she went I'm a little bit drunk, just randomly. And she appeared to be someone that may have been a little bit drunk quite often. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, and she went, oh, sorry. I said, hey, nothing to be sorry about. Are you having a good time? <laughs> and she said, she said, yeah. And then uh, she said, uh, I'm going to have a little party. Do you want to come? <laughs> and I said, I said, actually, I said, I've got quite a lot of things to do, but I hope you have a great time. And she then just looked at me and she went, can I have a hug? I said, oh. yeah, of course you can. And again, you could see other people, because she was a bit loud in the energy. Other people were, you could see there was this wariness. I went, come here, I put my arms around her, like pulled her in, gave her a squeeze. And um, and then, you know, she was just very playful. And again, you could almost see there was a sense around of people just uh, feeling a bit more relaxed around this kind of frenetic energy. And then I get to pay for my food and the person in front of me, she was a little bit short, on, on money of to get all of her shopping and she was like oh you know i'm like just leave, leave those bits and I'll, I'll go to the car and see if i can find the rest of the money and then i got there and i just said just put those through on mine and then i just got them i said here and just gave them to her and they were just three examples of really kind of from the flight to me returning home you know within a few hours where i felt like there's just these little opportunities that ordinarily i think i would have missed yeah yeah I think I would have missed. And they were small, but there were these just moments where it feels like those subtleties, if we all start to do more of them, I feel like there'll be a cascading effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you don't have to move mountains to, to achieve the change or to see the change. If you can really become aware, aware of the subtle details and the small things that are going around in our daily life uh, yeah i try to do the same when i notice that people have a little bit of harder time or they're not in such a good energy to simply be friendly to give them a good smile to ask them how are you doing if, uh, if everything's fine is there something that i can help you out with or you see uh, an older person struggling on the streets with, with their with their luggage or, or with their shopping so uh, all these kind of small things and when you see people change and all of a sudden they're like oh uh, thank you 
And it's it's just a small simple thing, but it can lift the day in such a beautiful way. Yeah. Even if you're feeling a little bit anxious yourself, and by just by doing yeah certain actions like this, that it it not only lifts your own energy, but in the same time you're lifting the energy for the people around you as well. Yeah. And it's really beautiful, and I think it's a, a more potent foundation to start building on top to instead of always trying to achieve. The big world changes, I would say. No, I mean, it's it all starts with small things. Huh? Yeah, absolutely, and and I can see that in you, Nick. You know, I see that in your demeanor and your energy. I I I can feel that from you. It's really kind of self evident. Um, <laughs> and yeah, you know, again, I I of last couple of years, I find myself often just considering some of the things that Jesus said, and um, when he said, you know basically love your neighbor as yourself there's two things implied there one you're meant to love yourself <laughs> two in order to love your neighbor as yourself it means you have to see your neighbor as yourself which means i i i don't see a separation between you and i i yeah. recognize the oneness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i recognize the oneness that when i look at you i'm, I'm really just looking at a an expression of of what expresses in me i'm yeah. looking at that one consciousness expressed through you so for me to love you as me first i have to love myself one and two i have to recognize that the, the idea of us being like separate or different is somewhat of an illusion and um yeah again that's it's actually i think a, a profound few words that if you kind of sink into the depth of it, of again, how does that influence how we how we interface with others? You know, I, I see this person and I just love them the way that I'd love me because I see them as me. I realize we're the same. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. And that's really something beautiful. And it's actually beautiful to give it away in the in this episode as well for the audience. It's a it's some very potent and valuable uh concepts of cultivating in ourselves yeah? uh, and then you stop to see things as separate it, it's like yeah there's no separation anymore right? it like it, it makes the illusion crumble down yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. really beautiful i love it and like uh with the board what, what is the intention of the board uh that, that you guys are coming together where do you guys want to take this uh, and what's gonna come or what's the percept or perspective for the future with the board yeah so the, the the think tank really is comprised of some some of the best philosophers in the world and the scientists and you know there's people there you know the doctorates from harvard and oxford and mit and it's there's a very scholarly group there and people have been involved like richard schwartz from the internal family systems and um Aubrey, you know, is, is is stepping on, and I'm new to it. I was like, I say, I was invited there in in June, and then I was in Belgium, and now I'm stepping in, and it's really this idea of this new story, and it's to address the meta crisis, mm -hmm. and the meta crisis is basically there are there's existential risk. And it comes in two forms. One is the risk of the death of humanity. And two is the risk of the death of our humanity. Yeah. And one is the extinction of a species. And the other is what we kind of already see and take place. The, the death of our humanity It's the intimacy crisis. It's how technology is. And we're already seeing it. We're already seeing, you know, from the rise of social media, the increase of anxiety and depression and separation, the loneliness epidemic, how dating apps affect the dating sphere, how it affects relationships, just on every single kind of touch point of how we are hugely struggling as a species, hugely. Just when I went from Belgium, uh, from where I was in Belgium to Brussels, it was a one hour train ride. It took four hours because there was two attempted suicide attempts just in that one out what should have been a one hour journey 
you know, but the, yeah, it's a big thing in Belgium. Um, something that I had in the past as well. I was going to the the coastline uh, for school for one year, and it was actually a, a pretty casual thing that there were problems with the train during the week. Like, oh, it's somebody else that tried to jump on the rails, and it's crazy. Yeah? Um, like I grew up in Belgium, and to see how. Uh, it's maybe not the right thing to say, but then the darker and the darker that things started to get, but it's also almost like it's getting more into the into the light or it's becoming more clear or that all these like these elements that people were not bringing into awareness that it's getting more and more clear today while all of, the, all of a sudden we start to see more and more darkness, but it's yeah, also in a beautiful way that that there is now the opportunity to bring attention to it, no, yeah. And that's really what, um, you know, the the kind of the the, the co presidents are, Dr. Mark Gaffney, Dr. Zach Stein, and they're both legitimate geniuses. It's just and, and not, you know, metaphorically term of phrase, like actual geniuses. They 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 write. They're the kind of people that write sixteen hours a day. They just write, 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 and you know they've been working on this for years and they're basically writing this great library and it is this new story for humanity and it's breaking down really everything from social structure infrastructure and superstructure and ultimately the goal is how we went from like pre-modernity to modernity and there was the renaissance period in florence the, the da vinci the the renaissance it's it's to do the same it's to have a renaissance and to move to a new era, to a new story. And, you know, they're as committed to it as you could possibly imagine. You know, Mark will often say he will have certain nights where he just doesn't sleep because he can't stop thinking about this certain area of existential risk. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was talking to a friend about it yesterday and he, and he said like, oh, he's like, I just don't get why people are so bothered about like how it will be when we're not here. Mm -hmm. and it's like well first of all i said he said to me he said you know i get why he might be mark because he's like in his 60s and maybe when you get to that point in your life you start thinking about it more and he said but why why, why do you feel it so much at you know in your 30s and i said brother i just i could just feel like first of all i deeply believe in the continuity of consciousness and past lives now if we have past lives it's likely we're going to have future lives so we're going to be coming back what world do we want to come back to? And <laughs> said again, a better world, I would say. Yeah. I hope so. And, and secondly, you know, I've, I have a daughter, and there are future generations, and it's not just my daughter. Again, we have to realize that we're not we're not separateness; it's the one consciousness. And to to Mark's point, there are billions of lives that have not you know there, there, there are billions and billions of lives that are still to come that might not come yeah that might not and actually they only have one hope and it's us yeah it's uh, us humanity from today huh? now yeah like so we we have the option to create a world where they actually get to be born like they get to be made manifest like they get to to write their story in the chapter of the universe, you know, and and who who, who else is going to do it? Who else is going to do it? Because it's easy to say, oh, well, I can't do anything. Let's pass it on to someone else. But if everybody does that, no one does anything. Uh, no, and it's something that we see in politics today as well, just as one of many examples, but it's like, yeah, okay, but this is just my time, and then after that, it's not my problem anymore, and I just pass it on to the next generation that's going to step in line, but then after all these generations, nothing is really changing, so it's really up to each individual to take their responsibility and the actions to change what they see that's going on, because you see it for a reason, I, I believe for myself, that if I'm aware of something, like there is a reason you're aware of it. So you're in a position that you're able to take actions and to respond to it and to flip it around in a way that you see fit or that feels more from a place of love and balance, harmony, I, I don't know. And it isn't next generations. It's so important as well. 
that I, I noticed for myself, and it's something that I had in my first ayahuasca ceremonies also. That she kind of she, I never really had a, a very good relationship with my dad, and she kind of put me in his shoes, and just I could feel his pain and his suffering, and instead of being judgmental towards the way that he lived his life and that he made the choices that he made. All of a sudden, I, I could understand why he made specific choices and why he went into addiction and so on and so on. And then actually by realizing like, oh, but that's where he came from. And now I have the opportunity to change this in myself. And then to realize months later, like, oh, but now I made these choices and I started to integrate or implement the insights that I got from the ceremony. And all of a sudden you see the change in your parents as well. It's almost like you change the thing in the genetic heritage. And all of a sudden your parents, they're also relieved of these blocks or, or these things that hold them back. And then it's the same for future generations. Huh? Everything that you manage to dissolve and process in yourself and to cleanse in a way. Yeah, all of a sudden you give more opportunity to the future generations as well to start with a cleaner slate. So I can definitely see the value as well then as a parent, how important it is towards the, the, your own children. But you can see it in a collective way as well. Huh? And the things that we do then for ourselves as well, for future generations. If you see how fast things can flip around, then yeah, there is no no question anymore in like, why, why would I avoid this kind of work or the possibilities of, of processing it? Yeah. Absolutely, man. And, you know, for, for me, I, I, I just feel deeply in me. It's, it's the reason I'm here on this planet. I, I just know it. I know it all the way up and all the way down. I feel it throughout me. And I know this is, this is the commitment for the rest of my life. And it's exciting because how that shows up for me now, you know, I start the podcast in January and I'm, I, I coach, I coach people and I help guide personal transformation and breakthrough. And it's kind of the, the reimagining who you are through understanding deeper what you are and it's the idea of creating this sense of freedom but you know, it's, it's the the program that i have is freedom within and it's the freedom from the past the freedom to be and the freedom to become yeah and that's like my right now where i'm in my life so i work people in that capacity i'm just adding in the visionary plant medicines to to go along with that to be incorporated with coaching and then ongoing integration so there's that in my own lane. And then I'm a part of this larger piece where it kind of feels like it's Avengers Assemble, mm -hmm. where we all have our own, you know, roles individually, but then we also, we, we band together and it feels, when you start to realize, and we kind of mentioned this yesterday on the group call we did, that we're, we're not just, accidental or coincidental we're actually intended we're actually intended to be here and we're intended by reality and as such we're needed by reality we're actually needed and to be invited into the think tank that i have been in to kind of have this you know role that i'm stepping into to actually feel this this calling and to be seen by these other people i can't underestimate the value of that to be a part of something bigger, to be part of something bigger than yourself, to be in service to something greater and to actually feel like you're needed by something greater is this thing I keep coming back to is like a life of such deep meaning and what better gift could there possibly be than a life that's worth living? Yeah. I can only find deep gratitude for it. Yeah. It's a blessing almost. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, just for anyone who's listening, I just encourage them to answer the call if they feel it. And if they're listening to this kind of podcast and if they're still here at this point now, yeah. <laughs> something in them that resonates, right? And, you know, if, if they feel that calling, sometimes our ego is not just inflationary. It's not just, oh, I'm amazing. Also the ego, because it's just a story. It's the story of the self. The ego can also say, well, I can't do that. I'm not capable or maybe he can, but not me. Fill in the blank. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. it, it, it can only be you. If you're yeah. listening to this, it can only be you. 
and you are literally needed and there are people out there right now and there are generations and and voices and humans that are not yet made manifest that are actually relying on you right now to to step into your own personal power and to share the gift that you are because each one of us are a gift and that gift needs to be shared and it's only when we share and we come together and we create this this symphony this unique symphony where we all have our own instrument to play but it's only when we play our instruments that the symphony can be created mm-hmm. and you know right now I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing and sharing the work of the center of mark and um you know i feel like it's important to 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 evoke and to cite him and his genius and you know i highly recommend um if you want someone to study where someone's really spent decades on the on the deepest kind of thought around this i highly recommend it but i just feel it all the way in me and just us doing things like this where we're connecting in this way it's just more it's more of these pieces where we find each other where we come together and the more we do that the more of us we need to find each other we need to reach out we don't need to sit in the shadows and just be um you know a spectator like step in step Mm -hmm. forwards come together because the more of us that come together the more we can really just have this transmission of of love and truth and beauty and then we can spread that more and more person by person starting with ourselves and then we can really be that change that we want to see. Yeah. I see it in the small things that don't uh, aim for the big mountain straight away. And I really love it. And it's beautiful. Uh, like for me personally, it's really a relief to hear uh, the concept of the board and also what you guys are doing in the background. And there are so that so many people are involved. Uh, uh, yeah, the world really needs it. So it's amazing. Uh, and I'm really happy to hear that this is happening you know uh, i really want to wish you good uh, yeah a lot of good luck with it as well uh yeah it's beautiful to hear your story man uh, it's really motivating to keep on going with everything that we're feeling and sensing and yeah what's coming to the awareness of, of what you want to do and where you can, want to continue with it and that it's not about only ourselves but it's really for everything and yeah the world that we live in yeah we it's it's we you know we it's it's ours to own it's ours to do and we do it for the all and Mm -hmm. uh, um and i just have this deep and and, and as i say it i i have the you probably can't see on the camera i feel my head stand on end (laughs) i truly feel in me like all the way like to the depth of my soul that we are being held and we are being guided by the divine and just the way you and i we found each other it wasn't it wasn't coincidence and anyone listening to this it wasn't coincidence we find each other and and it's only when we come together that i think we can really actually we can move mountains we can move mountains together because that field that we create that energy that we create between us it's not one and one is two it's one and one is 11 yeah, it's, yeah. it's exponentialized and um i just have i have this faith that we're all being brought together and that we can do this mm-hmm. we can we can do it and when we're guided by that when we're guided by the the i the one the one consciousness and we're just parked to the side our story that mike tells we can't do it like let's actually play let's play full out and see what's actually possible and what's capable but we have to step onto the field and we have to swing the bat yeah that's the only way we can hit a home run we, we can't do it from the from the the stands watching we have to step on the field and we have to swing the bat and sometimes we might miss mm-hmm. but we keep, we keep swinging we're, we're gonna hit a home run uh-huh. It is so, and it's all just part of the process. It's uh, really no reason to shy away from. Oh no, what if I don't hit it straight away? But uh, yeah, we all have a process to learn, you know. Uh, and it takes a couple of hits before you, yeah, hit the ball. I would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. And and thank you, brother. You know, for the invitation, and thank you for doing what you're doing. And and it's exciting. I'm excited to see how 
you're kind of stepping up more and emerging more and I can I can see you know you've got so many so many gifts to share and and so much of it actually is in the energy of your being it really kind of shines through I think anyone who's listening to this will really feel it and see it and it's uh it's it's great and it's exciting to see where where that goes oh thank you it's been a big challenge to accept it and embrace it and to to put myself out here so i have a thank to my wife as well for this she really kind of pushed me up the mountain like yep, it's time to go man like <laughs> get out of your corner i really felt comfortable uh to stay in the shadows and to just do my own thing and but it's yeah like there really comes a point that you have to start sharing and be there for others as well um, something that the plans were very clear on as well mm-hmm. and then it's beautiful uh, even two years ago it's like yeah man it's time to go and work with other people like, uh, how like i'm not ready to serve ayahuasca i wouldn't even know how, how to open up myself and then just by being open and taking the things that came along on my path even without knowing how it will go or continue or where it will bring me just to be open for the opportunity uh, opportunities that were offered. It's beautiful to see uh, where, where we are standing today. And I'm really, yeah, I'm really curious and excited to see where things will be going. Uh, the the positive energy and just the good energy that, that comes along with it. It's, um, I, I, I told this already to friends as well, that uh, two years ago, I couldn't even imagine like it wasn't even in my perspective to see what's going on today. And then realizing, oh, but we're just starting. And I'm, it's like, I didn't even saw this for my whole life plan. And then, yeah, but I'm just 33. Like there's still so much to go and so much to do. So yeah, so much opportunities, so much space to, to do beautiful things and to see yeah, whatever will come. And I embrace it. I'm really happy for it. <laughs> yeah we're, we're just getting warmed up mm-hmm. yeah yeah but it is yeah i'm still getting used to this as well man. uh it's uh still a big challenge to come out and so on but i start to feel more more comfortable with it as well um but yeah it's good i'm fine with it and i'm really glad that i had the opportunity to hold space for our conversation as well and thank you for coming on it um, and then I would ask you uh, just a couple more things. Uh, what is your future plan for your personal process? Uh, and, and what can people expect from you if they want to work with you? Yeah, yeah, thank you for asking. Um, you know, each... As I move forward, I want to constantly just ask and tune in to, to source, to God, to the divine, to the all that is. Am I in the right direction? How do I serve more? What you know? What do I need to do? And I feel like I want to be guided with that as my my north star. That's what my compass is pointing to, and being open to the evolution of what that looks like. One of those things that came up for me recently was the opportunity to train with, you know, Maestro Hamilton Souther, who I know you've you've had on, and I've always felt this calling to incorporate the visionary plant medicines into my coaching the the type the type of and i say coaching it i I I often think that it's not quite the right word for what i do it's it feels much more like um one a very deep intuitive guidance where i really feel in my body i feel what's coming up for the other person i feel and then i weave that through with my own kind of understanding of 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 behavior and with philosophy but then i also tune in and ask what's coming through and it all happens very very quickly um so that happens um and that when it comes to one-on-one coaching that can be very personal and very very unique for each person it's just what's coming up what's alive right now for them and i really kind of just tune in and feel into that with that deep space of presence so my modality really is a combination of um you know the the training i've done with Eckhart Tolle uh in in his course and teachings on being a teacher of presence so there's the element of presence there's the element of like the dharma and that things that i study with mark gaffney which is a lot of philosophy there's my own lived experience there's the downloads that i get and the energetic feelings i get 
And then there's now going to be the addition of all of that with the visionary plant medicines. So cannabis and psilocybin ceremonies, where it's actually going to be active coaching through that process. And then eventually like San Pedro and ayahuasca when the time is right. And obviously that will be more ceremonial, but that is more of a recent thing that's entered my periphery, but I just felt I tuned, I asked it, uh, you know, I tuned in and asked and it was, I already felt a yes, but I wanted to clarify. So there's, there's this constant evolution of, of what things could look like right now. I feel very cool to, to have a home that can also be a retreat center. And I've been looking at properties for that to be a possibility um, to create that sanctuary where when people enter, I want the feeling to be, this feels more like home than my home. Yeah. There's that deepest feeling of just ah oh, entering in where the, their nervous system just, and to create that space. And, you know, I felt this intuitively for a long time when it comes to what the new therapeutic model should be and, and mark said it and i hadn't heard him say it so it's beautiful to feel the resonance there that the new kind of therapeutic model of really people seeking transformation that's what it is it's you know like that's what therapy they go to therapy for but it has to be built on the foundation of love and the thing that really changes everything the difference that makes the difference is love and so much of the modern kind of practices, the Western therapeutic model is devoid of any kind of like the idea of has to be complete separation, can't be any like involvement with the person. It's like, man, if you're coming from a deep place of like love and empathy and compassion, how do you not feel? But but also if you know how to create the channel in yourself, if you know how to evoke the spirit of of, of God all the way through, it's like, I don't have to then take that home with me. It doesn't have to be this thing where I have this vicarious trauma by listening to theirs because I can, can create the space and the energy for that to be consumed by God that's in me, through me, and as me, and in through as them and all around us. Like, okay, now we can work with this in a completely different way. Yeah. And for so many people, you know, this came from my first ayahuasca journey. So one that I, I had to face these demons and I thought I had to fight them. And then I had the awareness that it wasn't fighting that was required it was loving and what might make someone appear to be demonic or evil that kind of behavior is their pain and their pain is from any time that they needed love and didn't receive it yeah that's what created the pain so then if we're looking at like even you know someone who's experienced trauma what is their trauma it's really it's a pain it's pain from a time where they didn't receive love and they needed it or you know there's the averse of that they received the opposite of love so it's like for me for my coaching modality it's a deeply intimate experience where i feel so much love for the people that i that i'm working with so it doesn't just feel like coaching it feels like this deeply intimate loving experience that's that's really the foundation then of of everything else that it's built on so the the different modalities but what's underpinning it it's this deep deep love for the the individual and to want to see them in their entirety and to to honor and to cherish the person that they are and then weave through all the rest because just that energy alone when someone can feel that and receive that i really think that's the difference that makes the difference I'm really going to the roots actually instead of getting lost in the details of the stories and so on. Yeah. It's really like this red line that goes all the way back to the roots and then the story doesn't really matter. Yeah. It's beautiful that you really have this essence to really go straight to the point. And also in that way, you give people the space to cultivate themselves in the ways that they would love to cultivate themselves in. Uh, and the way they want to grow i really love it it's beautiful and i got a taste from it myself as well which uh, did some wonders it so uh, yeah i think you're doing beautiful work so i no, thanks so much brother and I'm, I'm excited for this being the beginning of our relationship and just to see what unfolds from here because i know it's i know it's just the start and uh i'm excited about the unknown future yeah. i'm uh, really happy for it as well and grateful for it as well really beautiful thank you man and uh, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you in person 
Yeah, sure. So the best place is probably Instagram, which is Sabri Gazelle, S-A-B-R-I-G-A-Z-A-I-L, Sabri Gazelle on Instagram. Um, on YouTube, there's the Lost and Found podcast, and that's also on Spotify and on Apple, all the, all the podcast platforms. So Lost and Found is the name of the podcast. Sabri Gazelle is me. I do have the website, myfreedomwithin.com, but the best place to reach out, I would say, is Instagram. I'm I'm quick to reply on there. And if anyone does want to start a conversation and just to explore any ideas, yeah, like I'm that's kind of how I do. And like you and I had I offer like a free kind of first session with people, just dive into things that might be coming up for them. And there's never any uh feeling of of you know there's no obligation for anything to come after that. I really believe that things unfold exactly as they're meant to. So it's not just like a bait to try to get people to then go into coaching after. Um, there's always the space and the opportunity for that. But actually, sometimes the most magical things can come out of just the place from offering. The more you want to offer, the more you want to give from a place of love. There are things that just come out of that naturally. So that's the space it's from. That's the offering. Oh, that's beautiful man really love it nice well then i would like to thank you for today's conversation and uh, i'm looking forward and it will be awesome to have this uh yeah <clears throat> to have another podcast and to continue our conversations uh, really looking forward to see what comes forth in the unknown future <laughs> thanks so much brother me too thank you man have a nice day and um, yeah catch you on the flip side <laughs> Thank you, Sabri. <laughs>